Would you think that in organizations though where sales and marketing have achieved that stronger alignment and that you know really marching to the beat of the same drum that despite the challenge that, that naturally turnover and sales represents perhaps it might help shorten that onboarding time or that getting them to, to start bringing cash in the yeah. door because there's less confusion in the organization. The messaging is quite clear. We're all sort of... Yes, I, I think that's absolutely critical. But I also think it's down to how you um, construct a sales team and all of the support infrastructures that go around it, which includes, you know, everything that's happening in marketing. But it's not just that. It's also things like pre-sales, subject matter expertise, all these different things. Uh, even getting executives involved in particular deals. The deals that tend not to land, certainly in the large enterprise space, are the ones where you know one sales executive has a relationship with one person in the client organization yeah. they're facing off to because my mate Dave <laughs> said it's going to happen in three months' time, therefore we're all right. Hope is not a strategy. <laughs> right. Uh, but actually having a proper sales plan for a pursuit whereby you're mapping different people and different stakeholders to other people in your organization so you have a broad church of contacts mm. within an organization. It may be the people that are in the line of business. It may be the people in finance, the people in procurement, some of the executive team building those executive bridges. Where you're getting into that, that requires orchestration and it requires support from different parts of the business because you may be running a business dinner somewhere to bring people in and do some thought leadership with them at the same time as you are having a demonstration of a product or service at the same time as you know you are having um, a meeting between your finance people and the finance people on the other on the other side of the table to talk about how the deal is <laughs> going to get structured now these are all things that would be happening concurrently in large deals yeah and oftentimes I see that that's a missing facet. Definitely. Well, I, I know in my experience, I'm, I'm sure you've had the same. Marketing people actually quite like getting out with the customers and they'll usually offer, hey, I'd be happy to go to a dinner or come out and meet your customer, explain what we're doing, what, what's our route of travel. And I think sales is um, hesitant to, or maybe we just forget, but to utilize those resources. So I think when you achieve that alignment and you know you really feel like you're sort of standing in the ditch together. Yes. I think you do take advantage of that. And of course, everyone that sits outside of sales to a customer is far less threatening. And um, they seem to have less of an agenda or there's a perception that they're gonna get perhaps um, a fuller answer, not because sales won't give it to them, but also they're not always empowered with all the information. So um, I think you're right. It is about really thinking more collaboratively, not just sales and marketing alignment, but the entire throughout organization. the organization. Absolutely. And how you can create a partnership between your business and the customer's business. And, and obviously you can't scale that to every size of customer, but um, to be quite strategic, as you'd said, around where you should create not only those internal alignments, but the alignments with your prospects and customers. Absolutely. Um, I think we definitely see more success. Well, you, you have a rich tapestry of experience and you've been doing this with companies today. So can you give um, any examples that, you know, you may not be able to name names, but where where they've got it right and kind of maybe a peek at how they do it. How do they go from maybe being disconnected and walk that journey of becoming really partners uh, arm in arm in the sales process? Yeah. I mean, a, a great example that I was, I was talking to um, a client the other day, uh, actually, who's gone through this process and done an amazing job of it, actually. But the, the, the marketing leadership there um, has been around that business now for 20, 25 years and ha is well respected, understands the sales point of view, um, really works hand in glove with his sales counterpart. And that is absolutely front and center part of the, the, the success that they have. They've then also entirely agreed, this is effectively the order of service as to how we get from unknown to known, to suspect, to prospect, to pipeline, to deal, to close. And they've mapped all of that out and they know who has responsibility for each part of that value chain. And they're very, very clear that the benefit that each part of that process delivers to the next part. And I think that's part of how they've been so, so, so successful. And what's really interesting is that they've also done this alignment, not just around sales and marketing as functions, but sales and marketing technology stacks. 
Mm. which I think is another really interesting facet because oftentimes in organizations, uh, sales will own something like the CRM because that's the sales tool. And then there will be a separate marketing tool that owns another view of your customer about how we contact them and how we talk to them. And the two aren't aligned. So people don't even know who's been contacted in various different organizations that they are trying to tap into at any given point in time. Yeah, the technology stack, I think, is is a substantial hurdle in the process of sales and marketing alignment because it, if everyone's source of truth is different um, or you even measure different things or you define things differently, um, I, I know in one business I worked with, they had about 40 definitions of churn. So how then do I even know w- what churn really is if we have no common understanding? And um, the technology stack problem is not an easy one to fix. It's expensive. Um, it can be lengthy. So it's around how do you create the right time of dialogue, at least with stakeholders, a common conversation, some common objectives, goals, yep. KPIs, um, compensation, whilst hopefully you can fix some of those technology distractions, yeah. if, I, if it's fair to call them that. And, you know, it, it's not easy. No. It's not easy. And it goes back a little bit to what you were saying. You know, whilst it sounds simplistic and it sounds like it's something that's, you know, why wouldn't we do that? Because it, it's it's really straightforward, right? The realities of actually getting it done, I think, become really quite intricate because it, it impacts so many different parts of the business yeah. and so many different individuals within it that you really have to have almost that guiding coalition to, to make that happen. And where I found it's worked well in the past is where you start small. So it doesn't have to impact an entire organization. You may say there's one sector that we are selling into that we really want to focus on getting that marketing and sales alignment right. And you pick one or two sales reps to work with directly with marketing, and then they suddenly start seeing results in their pipeline, credible pipeline that moves through stale stages really quickly, that's properly qualified, they have real insight into the deals, unweighted pipe becomes weighted pipe becomes closed deal in a faster sales cycle. As soon as you start seeing that happen with one or two people, guess what? Everyone else wants a piece of it. Yeah. And that, I think, is how you create that kind of a groundswell quite quickly. And that goes back to the point you raised right at the top of the conversation around culture, because now we have cultural alignment because my metrics are your metrics and your metrics are my metrics. And I've just helped you achieve something and you've helped me achieve the same thing. And now we're buddies. So let's make sure we carry on working that way. And actually, it's created this really good symbiotic relationship that now everybody else wants a piece of. Well, I think it lets salespeople go out and do what they do best, and it, it allows marketers to do what they do best instead of it getting quite convoluted because you're not aligned. So then you have people yeah. stepping in and doing things that, you know, actually could be more obstructing than positive. And um, yeah, I think you're right. When you get something that works and accelerates sales, every other salesperson wants it because they're just competitive by nature. Yep. So if someone else has got a leg up on them, they they, they want in on that opportunity. Um, I think it's good that we're leaving people on a positive note because there could be a, you know, the conversation often is one that's worrisome, isn't it? We know we need to do it. We're not sure how to get there. But I think you've given us some really tangible, practical ways to get going. If you could offer any last pearls of wisdom to those watching this interview, Mm. what would it be so that they can go out and sort of make this happen in their business as a sales leader? Just do it. (laughs) You know, it's, it's one of these things. People can talk a good ball game. And I find that um, the thing that kills and stifles business more than anything else is just a lack of decision making and procrastination. Just start it off. Excellent. I think you're right. It's all about, um, some say, beg for forgiveness, don't ask for permission, right? (laughs) You're spot on, Tamara. You're spot on. Excellent. Well, it's been such a pleasure to have this discussion with you today. No, thank Um, you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed it. You're very welcome. Thanks for sharing all your pearls of wisdom. All right. Brilliant. Thank you. Cheers.